corrupt, violent, badly ruled. That's the Africa we always seem to see on our TV screens. Unless corporations are in for mega profits from natural resources, why would they ever be there or want to invest there? Lack of investment is one very important reason why Africa remains so poor. So in this issue of Hands On, we travel the length and breadth of the continent to show you the Africa you so seldom see, one bursting with social entrepreneurs, creativity and invention. Madaguri, northern Nigeria. Temperatures can reach 50 degrees centigrade. An unreliable power supply means there is little relief from the extreme heat. At times we get maybe two hours of electricity a day and we don't have electricity since yesterday. That's about 24 hours. Vaccines to prevent diseases such as tetanus, hepatitis B and polio are rendered useless if they are not kept at a constant temperature. But one man's vision and business acumen in harnessing the sun's energy is already making a difference. With the amount of sunlight available in Nigeria, it seems here was an excellent opportunity to do something. The National Programme on Immunization covers quite a large number of preventable diseases such as polio, diphtheria, and the problem really is that vaccines have to be kept in a controlled temperature within limits of 2 degrees centigrade, and the solar fridges play an important part of that at the end of the chain in remote areas. With a notoriously unreliable electricity supply, many have turned to generators, but these aren't fail-safe either. Occasionally, we have a problem with the generator. At times, even now, the generator is needing constant service and it is very, very expensive. The vaccines travel thousands of kilometers by air to Abuja airport, truck to the state coal stores, and finally by motorbike to the remote clinics where women and children come from miles. I'm here to protect my child against cystic diseases. So far, Anthony's company, KXN Nigeria, has installed 165 solar charging systems. How do they work? The sunlight shines on these solar panels and the panel converts the light intensity into electricity which passes through this array cable to the controller and charges these batteries here. So you can use this even when the sun's gone down overnight. Typically, we run the solar vaccine fridges from the DC current, 24 hours a day, non-stop. For the businesses that succeed, training technicians and entrepreneurs is essential. Once trained, they should be able to construct the solar circuits and generate an income. Ultimately, Anthony hopes they'll pass their knowledge on to others. KXN has changed uh, my life. I went in to learn a lot within a very short period of time. I had to install this one at my house so that I can invite my customers to see it working. Right now, two customers who have subscribed for the system and I have installed one already. It is installed today. The children love it and I'm, it is changing my life for the better because I'll be able to read more. In recognition of its work, KXN Nigeria has been honored at the Ashton Awards for Sustainable Energy in London. With solar panels lasting more than 30 years, Anthony believes the opportunities for solar power are unlimited. People always look for their own solutions. So we see the opportunity for uh, solar businesses such as producing ice, freezing drinks, pumping water. So people are very keen to have a situation which is clean and affordable. Most importantly, the solar fridges are helping save lives. I get to eat this morning, around 9.15 in the morning. After born, then in the next day, I'm very happy. May God bless the twist for me. Ghana's Ashanti region, home to one of West Africa's most vibrant cultures, yet still cut off from the outside world. Some people are skeptical of the benefits of computers in such remote areas, but for one village, getting connected is kick-starting the local economy. The village of Patrienza established a community telecenter in 2000. It was an instant hit with residents keen to learn. 
The computer has really helped me since I've started. Now I can operate without any mistakes whatsoever. I used to sit by people to learn, but now I do everything on my own. Rural communities are often thought to be conservative. That's not the case here. I've registered to learn the program, and I paid two dollars. We were taken through the basics of computers and some software, and they also took us through some hardware exercises like assembling and dismantling. As I talk now, I can buy a computer case, buy the parts, and assemble them all by myself and sell them. The telecenter has become the hub of village life, attracting entrepreneurs and inspiring other business ideas. One is bicycle renovation. The sources of used bicycles are tracked down via the telecenter. The workshop remodels them to enable farmers to take produce to market. Bicycle, no mono. You're care free. We import bicycles from abroad. Our main reasons for redesigning the bicycles is to help our farmers reduce their burden. A credit scheme helps the farmers to buy their bicycles. They come to the centre to buy bicycles. Others may not have the resources to be able to afford a bicycle. You know, it's about $30, $40 per bicycle. So we have a high purchase programme. People come, we give their bike to them and they pay over a five to ten month period. Another thriving business at the telecentre takes advantage of a local resource, Rattan. It takes us about three days to build the frame, then it takes about a week to do the rest of the work and complete it, so it takes about ten days to finish up a piece like this one. These products, as well as handicrafts produced traditionally, have a limited market locally. That's where the telecentre comes in. It gives Patrienza a place in cyberspace and a shopfront in the world's thriving virtual marketplace. The Ashanti Akim Telecentre is still growing. Intrepid surfers can get a taste of the village via the website, and there are plans to attract adventurous tourists to stay at the guesthouse in this Ghanaian village. Welcome to the future, and like the website says, welcome to Patrienza. Here at the bauxite mines in Sangaredi, Guinea, they're extracting one of the world's most precious resources bauxite. Yet after 40 years mining bauxite, Guinea is still nearly top of the list of poorest countries. Now a new initiative developed by Conservation International Centre for Environmental Leadership and Business, CI Selb, Alcoa Alcan, the Guinea government and Guinea ecology is setting a precedent for Africa by factoring in environmental and social impacts when siting a refinery locally. Ibrahim Adanzo, DG of Alcoa Guinea, and Mariel Cantor of CI Selb are travelling together to one of the three possible locations. It's very important for a country like Guinea because it's going to add value to the bauxite, going to create jobs, going to bring investment, and it's going to help the country in its fight against poverty. That's why we've chosen to work with Alcoa here in Guinea, given that mining represents a major uh, portion of Guinea's local economy um, and understanding that that's important for the people of Guinea to have that income into the country. First stop for Ibrahima and Marielle is Hamdalai village. They meet with the chief and community who've lived here for 250 years. Uh, there was a workshop held that identified this volcano region as important for biodiversity, especially for the ecosystem services. Despite concerns from his community, the chief is generally positive. We would like to have the refinery built here because of the benefits and the chance of employment. Environmental concerns are of equal priority for CI Selb and their partner Alcoa. CI Selb is using a new technique, EBAP, initial biodiversity assessment and planning to help companies address these at the earliest stages of a project design. As part of this process, an international team of scientists spend three weeks surveying several sites in Guinea. We have a rapid assessment 
program team out here, bringing a number of international and local scientists together. In Guinea, uh, we work quite closely with Guinea Ecology, a, a local uh, NGO that concentrates on environmental conservation. Uh, they've helped us in terms of uh, providing local scientists. Hands-on joined the team for their last 24 hours. First up are the birders and primate specialists. We joined the birders. We heard African broadbill the other day here. And today it's already finished now because it sings before dawn usually. It sounds rather mechanical because it's not a, a real song. Back at the camp, the primate party has already returned. They've got lucky and found some fresh evidence. People were always reluctant to dart uh, wild living chimpanzees or gorillas and until the um, PCR procedure was developed you couldn't really use samples from the wild and so it's the same procedure as the police uses in, in crime scenes you know when they collect hairs or saliva or something but uh, we found out there's more DNA in the feces actually. Encouraged, mammal expert Abdullahi Barry decides to check his cameras. With camera trapping, you increase the chances of you getting them on the picture, and that tells you the kind of animals that are found in that habitat, which is a good way of doing inventory. It's difficult to see. You can see tracks, but it's good to see what kind of animals are there. So we have our sixth camera down here. Elsewhere, the botanists are in the middle of a long walk through the canopy, collecting samples and trying to identify species. It is unfortunate for us that we do not have flowers on it, so it will be a little bit hard for us to, to identify it directly. We are not having the same sensation, that's why. <laughs> we always come up with different smells, because I'll think it smells like something very normal to me, and it will, it's not normal to Thomas. So. Meanwhile, back at the camp, all are recording their findings or documenting samples. And this is the first time it's been seen we've got males and females and young, young stages to work with. And so this is quite different from the other crabs that are found here. And it's in a, a different lineage of, of crabs. And so I'll turn it over so you can see that it, this one is an adult of this size. The other ones that we were looking at were much bigger than that, adults at that kind of size. Early evening, it's time to check the frog traps. It's a taika dina chubotsai, and it's very interesting because I, I don't know that it's uh, described uh, from Guinea before, so it's something very special. They're good indicators for the changes in the habitat, and so they are really sensitive to climate change. Collecting continued throughout the night, and we joined the crab specialist. They're adapted to a particular environment. Each species has its own requirements, and uh, if you pollute rivers or if you drain swamps, or if you cut down forests, these crabs are not going to be able to listen. Sorry about the frogs there. <laughs> <That's not laughs> Once all the results are collated and short reports written up, CI Cell will convene a meeting with Alcoa, the community and government representatives. The outcome will make recommendations about the refinery site and the long-term conservation of biodiversity in Guinea. What CI is hoping will come from this work is something that NGOs such as Guinea Ecology working on the ground here can take to Alcoa and say this is the biodiversity in your area and so this is what we think needs to be done to conserve it. We should really make sure that we listen to the local population, we understand their needs and also uh, definitely the, the local populations also un understand the limits that they should not go over. And I don't mind if we don't find all the solutions at the same time, but I wish that the environment be part also of the, uh, the things that you can look at to see if there are some changes happening. I think that that's the challenge. How to minimize the negative impact of the project over the communities and rather to have a positive impact on people and uh, in an environment. Tanzania has an 800 kilometer coastline and 30% of the population's protein intake is from fish. Demand for fish has increased due to the booming tourist industry. As in much of East Africa, most of the marine fish caught here are from the reefs of the Indian Ocean coastline 
this inshore fishing may well be exceeding a sustainable level. Small-scale fishermen are unable to reach the more abundant stocks of deep sea fish like tuna further out to sea. Now that's about to change. The majority of fish currently caught and sold in the markets of Tanzania is from the reefs and overfished shallower waters. The scarcity of large fish means high prices that only hotels can afford. The fish we are getting in the market are grouper, red snapper, parrotfish and jackfish. Not many tuna. Yesterday we only got three in the entire market. When we buy the large fish, we take them to the hotels. We then fillet the fish and come back with the carcass. The head and the bones are then sold and people use them for making soups at home. Most offshore fishing is done using gill nets. These can be over one kilometre long and take a dreadful toll on marine life. The nets catch everything, including endangered species such as turtles. Turtles are sometimes caught in our nets, but this is unfortunate. Dolphins are also caught in deeper water. Scientists supported by the UK Department for International Development, DFID, have come up with a way to encourage fishermen to use the far less destructive hook and line tackle to catch tuna and other large fish. Taking advantage of the fact that fish congregate around underwater structures, a fish aggregating device, or FAD, is designed to attract tuna schools to a particular area so that fishermen can improve their catch without using drift nets. This is the first time a FAD has been deployed in Tanzania. It's made up of a one-ton anchor weight with a heavy-duty mooring chain connecting the buoy line, which may be up to a kilometer in length, depending on the ocean depth. At the surface, there are several floats and a buoy so that the fad can be located easily by the fishermen. The plan will be to deploy two fads northeast of Nungui, which is a focus point for tuna fishing. The fishermen will also be trained in new methods of fishing, which are cheaper, more environmentally friendly, and they will reap a fresher, more valuable fish. After placing the fads, we will go to seminars to be trained in the best fishing methods. Using a hook and line, there will be fewer problems and we can fish in the daytime and rest during the night. They can bring up a fish using something like the Samoan reel to haul a fish up to the boat which will allow them to land a fresh fish, which can then be bled and treated and placed on ice ideally and taken ashore and sold for a better price than they're getting with the, with the fish which are caught in the gill nets. When we go to fish at the fad sites, we will catch many tuna. Tuna are very popular with the tourists, so during the tourist season, when we are able to catch lots of tuna, our lives will be greatly improved. In Accra, the capital of Ghana, stalls cater for the demand for convenience food, African style. Vendors are often recent migrants to the city, seeing it as a good way to earn an income from traditional cooking skills. Unfortunately, a lack of clean water can mean their food is easily contaminated. Ghanaian delicacies like fufu and banku and kenki are a big hit with urban workers. I am a seamstress. I eat here because they are neat and the food is cheap, way cheaper than you would get to buy in a restaurant. All the food you want, you can get here. But not all experiences are as happy as Selena's. They say you are what you eat, but what are you eating? To find out, you need to take a closer look. The Food Research Institute in Ghana, with the UK Department for International Development, DFID, and the Natural Resources Institute has been doing just that. What we do normally is we take the samples from the field into very sterile containers and immediately transport the food to the lab for analysis. 10 grams of the food sample is added to a saline solution. This machine ensures that it's well mixed. Then a few drops are placed in a Petri dish and incubated at 30 degrees centigrade for 72 hours. 
In that time, any bacteria multiply into colonies, which can be counted to assess the level of contamination. Studies carried out at the Food Research Institute of over 45 samples showed that some, like Kenki, are safer than others due to their acidity, while Fufu was more easily contaminated. Unwashed hands can mean that Fufu, made from boiled cassava and plantain, is easily contaminated. Researchers have also found that the traditional cooking pots used by some of the vendors contain a high level of heavy metals such as lead, which is poisonous to the body. So the cooks are being encouraged to use these lead-free pots. To further reduce the risks, hundreds of street vendors have been trained to avoid the pitfalls of roadside catering and use running water for washing pots and pans. The aim of this uh, project is to find ways of overcoming the food safety hazards that are contributing to the loss of income for the uh, street food vendors. They called us for the sake of our personal hygiene and the environment in which we sell our food. They advise us not to use rotten tomatoes and rotten onions. Some other tips for aspiring caterers are using fresh water for washing up, separating raw ingredients from cooked products, and keeping cooked food hot enough to kill germs. But the training doesn't stop there. We train on uh, uh, environmental sanitation, uh, food hygiene, uh, personal hygiene, nutrition, and business management. Anything about dealing with food. As food quality increases, customers keep coming back, and word of mouth is now spreading the business benefits of hygienic cooking.